Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we thank you that uh, we can be together as your children, even though we're in different parts of the world, we can all be together, so to speak, in one place through technology. And Lord, as we go through this study now, we pray that you'll guide our thoughts and minds, help us to see the wonderful truths in your word. And may we put together the pieces of the puzzle, so to speak, that we find in the Bible so that we can learn about these important topics. So we invite your presence with us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a topic about the 144,000. And just some thoughts how we have some wonderful types in the Bible from the Levites, which gives us an insight into some of the, the roles or the future job of the 144,000. So we'll go through that. And yeah, if you have any thoughts or questions, feel free to pop them in. So here's a first question we need to ask. What happens at the second coming, which we know is going to happen soon? The world is gearing up for the last events. And the Bible says that when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. There's going to be fire when Jesus comes back. In fact, the Bible says as wax melts before fire, so the wicked shall perish before God. And it talks also in Thessalonians about the Antichrist system. And it says, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So when Jesus comes back with all the angels and all the glory, those who have resisted the Holy Spirit and rejected the gospel are going to be terrified, basically. And we get that from here in Revelation chapter 6. It says the wicked, these are the people who are lost. It says they hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is coming. Who shall be able to stand? So those that are lost, when Jesus comes back in all his glory and all the power, everything, they'd rather be crushed by a boulder than to have to face Jesus coming back in the clouds of glory. And so it asks that question at the end of that uh, chapter 6, who shall be able to stand? There's that interesting question at the end of chapter 6 of Revelation. And of course, this is answered in the very next chapter, and the answer is the 144,000. And we see that here. So there's the first verse, there's verse 17. So chapter 6 ends with verse 17. Who shall be able to stand? And the very next thing it talks about in chapter 7 is about the angels holding back the, <coughs> the winds of the earth. And then there's the ceiling takes place and it talks about the servants of our God. And it mentions the 144,000. And it says, I heard the number of them which were sealed. It was 144,000 from all the tribes of the children of Israel. And it lists these tribes, and it's interesting when you look through the list there. Um, it's you know it's interesting the list of tribes in the Bible they occur in different places, and they're not all the same. For example, the tribe of Dan is missing from here. And if you study what the attributes of the tribe of Dan were, we can start to understand why they don't appear here. They were known for their backbiting. So what attributes does the Bible reveal regarding the 144,000? It says, for example, here in Revelation 7, it says, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So what is this great tribulation that they go through? And Jesus mentioned this in Matthew chapter 24. The Rose, you, have a, you have a little unstable uh, internet. Um, ah, is it not working so well? Well, it was just right now that it was, uh, we lost you a little bit. Okay, my apologies. Um, yeah, I don't know what we can do about that. Um, no, but we can just, uh, if you just maybe uh, repeat the very last thing you said, so. 
Okay. Yeah. Yes. I heard. I heard everything. So that has to be something with uh, your computer, Eva. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm so okay. I'm sorry. I don't know. Okay. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I'll carry on. So yes, Jesus talked about the Great Tribulation, and the hundred and forty-four thousand come out of the Great Tribulation. And just by the way. In case there's any question here, Matthew 24, we're told, has two applications. And this great tribulation applies to two different times. One is the Dark Ages, when for over a thousand years there was persecution. And, you know, we call it the Dark Ages, of course. And then those persecutions are going to be repeated right at the end of the world again, when the, the deadly wound is healed of the beast power and the persecution happens again. So it's interesting. The whole of Matthew 24 has two applications. And clearly the 144,000 come out of the second great tribulation, the very intense one at the end of time. Now, what can we learn about the 144,000 and their role, what their job is? And we find here in chapter 7, it says... They're before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And another place here in chapter 14, it says, They follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. So a little question pops up. How can they both serve him day and night in his temple and also follow the Lamb, that's Jesus, wherever he goes? It seems to be two different things. And the answer is, we can get a clue here from the book of Luke. Do you remember when the angel visited Zacharias? And Zacharias was serving in the temple. And they had different courses. Like they'd have priests were allocated what they'd call a course. And they had the different courses had different names. For example, Zacharias was of the course of Abiah, it says. And so they were rostered on. They had a schedule to go and serve in the temple for a period of time, like a month. And then they'd go back home again. And he was serving in his rostered course when the angel appeared to him. And so if we take that as the type of what the 144,000 will do, obviously they're going to have different shall we say, roles or different jobs at different times. So some of them will be before the throne for a time. Maybe some will be in the temple for a time. So we can see from the Old Testament types how that could be. And the Levites, here's some more text to show that they served in courses, which means like they'd have a rostered period where they'd serve. What else about the 144,000 can we learn? And in chapter 7, it talks about they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. So this is after they're obviously saved up in heaven. So when did the sun light on them and in heat? And we read in chapter 16 of the seven last plagues how that the sun was ramped up when the fourth angel poured his vial on the sun. Power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with great heat. So clearly, the 144,000 have gone through these plagues. They've at least witnessed and maybe felt to some small degree these plagues that fall on the wicked. And the 144,000 were also told they sing the song of Moses. Now, what is that? What do we learn from the Bible? When the Revelation says they sing the Song of Moses, and we go, okay, what's the Song of Moses? We go back to the Exodus, and you recall the Red Sea crossing when God did this mighty miracle to save his people from the army that was coming to destroy them. And God parted the waters. But when the Egyptians tried to follow after, they were drowned, of course. And then it says, and then sang Moses and the children of Israel the song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he's triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea. So this was a song of deliverance, a song of victory, so to speak, where God had intervened for them and saved them. 
and obviously the 144,000 have a similar song such that it's called the Song of Moses. And here's a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. It says, With the Lamb upon Mount Zion, having the harps of God, they stand, the 144,000, and they sing a new song before the throne, a song which no man can learn, save the 144,000. It's a song of Moses and the Lamb, a song of deliverance. So just as the Israelites were delivered, so the 144,000 are going to be delivered from a similar um, army that's going to come to try to destroy them at the end of time. It says, none but the 144,000 can learn that song, for it's a song of their experience, an experience such as no other company have ever had. These are they which came out of great tribulation, it says. They've passed through the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. They've endured the anguish of the time of Jacob's trouble. They've stood without an intercessor, intercessor through the final outpouring of God's judgments. So when we put all these attributes together, we can see wonderful parallels between the Exodus and the Israelites leaving Egypt, God delivering them from what was taking place there and the Egyptian army chasing after them, and also what will happen to God's people at the end. For example, in Egypt, the plagues fell, the 10 plagues that God sent upon Egypt and Pharaoh to help him change his mind to let the people of Israel go. And likewise, in the last days, it's going to be the seven last plagues. And also the Passover, when the firstborn was slain, that was at midnight. And we read that God's people in the last days, their deliverance will come at midnight. The Israelites went into the wilderness, and likewise, the last generation will have to flee into the wilderness. But there God fed them, and likewise, God will look after his people in the last days. In the Exodus, Pharaoh's army pursued after the Israelites, and in the end time, Babylon's army will come to kill God's people with a death decree. Now, in the Exodus, initially the waters were helping Pharaoh by trapping the Israelites. And likewise, the waters are going to help Babylon. Waters being a symbol of peoples, multitudes, nations. The whole world will be against God's people on the side of Babylon. And in the Exodus, darkness fell. You can read that in Joshua 24 verse 7 at the time when Pharaoh came to get the Israelites. And likewise, there's going to be darkness in the fifth plague in the last days. God dried up the Red Sea, it says in Joshua 4.23. And interesting, one of the plagues is the Euphrates dries up. Israel was delivered, of course, and the saints will be delivered. And then the waters, which were helping Pharaoh by trapping the Israelites, ended up destroying Pharaoh, drowning him and his army. And likewise, the waters, representing people, will destroy, destroy Babylon when the nations turn against the papacy oh, Excuse me, in the last days. And of course, they sang the song of deliverance. Excuse me, sick. <clears throat> so you can see some parallels there. So who comprises this 144,000, these tribes? Are they literal Jews? And of course, if we go to the New Testament, we learn what it means to be part of Israel. This is from Ephesians chapter 2. So here's Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. And he's reminding them, he says in verse 11 here of chapter 2, he says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. So he's reminding the people of the church of Ephesus, you were Gentiles once upon a time, you were uncircumcised, as the, the Jews used to call you the uncircumcised. And in verse 12 he says, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, he says in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. In other words, they've been brought into this 
uh, Commonwealth of Israel. In verse 19 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So here was the Christian church at Ephesus, who once, when they were Gentiles, were called aliens from the Commonwealth of Israel and our fellow citizens of the Commonwealth of Israel. And in Galatians, Paul spells it out here, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. For as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. So clearly, the Israel of God includes the Gentiles who have become converted to Christ. So what is that teaching us? That the Gentiles who become Christians were considered Israel. And of course, James, when he wrote his epistle, he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. And he says, my brethren. So brethren in the faith, fellow Christians, are considered part of the 12 tribes. And of course, it's spelled out very plainly in Galatians. If you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So taking that principle through to Revelation, clearly the 144,000 is like Bible code language for true believers, true Christians. It's not about genetics or you know which what your genealogy is. It's about are you in Christ or not. So can we find some parallels between the Exodus and the last generation. Are there deeper parallels? And yes, there are. If you dig in, there's some wonderful parallels here between the Levites and the 144,000. So if we go back to the Exodus and the types, do you remember how Moses went up Mount Sinai and spent 40 days with God? And it says, the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and get him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. And it says later, when he, at the end of this period of time, 40 days, he, that's God, gave unto Moses, when he made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. So here's Moses receiving these Ten Commandments. But meanwhile, down the bottom of the mountain, what was happening? It says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. So after 40 days, they became impatient. And they went to Aaron and said, Make us gods. And this is what happened. Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which were in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So here's this terrible apostasy. The people, right at the foot of the mountain, where they could see the, the, the fire of God on the mountain there in the clouds, they made this idol, breaking the Ten Commandments. Now, is this a true story? And, of course, we'll pop in a little bit of archaeology here. This is me in Saudi Arabia a few years ago. And where my finger's pointing there is this interesting archaeological site which is fenced off. You can see the fence around it here when you zoom in. And on these rocks behind this fence are carved these interesting bull shapes. You can see here this crude carving of a bull. You can see the head on the left with its horns. And if you look at the coloration, the style of it, compare that with... The picture on the top right here, this is from a, a tomb in Egypt. And you can see the, the coloration 
of that bull on the top right there. So someone familiar with that coloration has tried to reproduce it here in a crude form on these rocks. And at the base of the mountain, here's another rock covered in these cow carvings. And where I'm pointing with my finger, you can see there is this figure underneath this bull figure. So you see that, this person, this human figure with their arms raised underneath this bull. And another carving shows this person holding the tail of a bull. So what's that all about? Well, here's a, a relief, a carving from Egypt of the Apis bull that the Egyptians worshipped. And what do you see underneath the bull? There's a human figure with its arms raised. And what do you see at the back end of the bull? Someone holding its tail. So somebody familiar with this Apis bull worship from Egypt has carved this on the rocks over here in Saudi Arabia. And of course, we believe this is exactly where the Israelites came. And this could be the very spot where this apostasy took place. The evidence is there. It's amazing. And we could do a talk on that one day. Anyway, <clears throat> so after Aaron had made this golden calf, it says they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and bought peace offerings. And it says the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So they're having this great revival meeting, if you like, this worship of this false god. Meanwhile, up on the mountain, God says to Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. And Moses came down, says his anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount, symbolizing what the people had done. They'd broken God's law. And then it says, he stood at the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And it says, all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. So the Levites came to Moses. And then he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Every man, put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. And it's interesting, by the way, at this mountain in Saudi Arabia, there's a large graveyard that's been found there which could tie up exactly with this. Now, as a result of this apostasy, what was the change <clears throat> made to the priesthood? Now, God's original plan for the priests was this. We read this in Exodus 13. Thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix. The males shall be the Lord's. That means the firstborn males. That's what it's talking about. So God's plan originally was all the firstborn males of all the different tribes would be set apart for God's service. But because of what took place with the golden calf incident, this is what God said later in, chap in Numbers chapter 3, Behold, I've taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that openeth the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore the Levites shall be mine. So instead of the firstborn males being the priests, it became the tribe of Levi, because they were the ones that stood firm during that time of apostasy. And here's another text that talks about this. Thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony and over all the vessels thereof and over all the things that belong to it. So the tribe of Levi became the priesthood instead of the firstborn because of their faithfulness during that golden calf incident. And when they came into the land and the different parts of Israel were allocated to different tribes, here's a map here sort of showing where the different tribes uh, occupied different parts of the land. One thing you'll notice there is that there's no colored area for the Levites. 
And this is what the Bible says. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name unto this day. Wherefore, Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren. It says, the Lord is his inheritance, according as the Lord thy God promised him. So they didn't receive any tribal lands where the different tribes had the different areas. The Levites, they were actually allocated some cities to live in with the area around them, but they didn't get any tribal lands. But it says the Lord is his inheritance. And that was a huge blessing. It might have sounded like a, they missed out on something, not getting tribal land. But the fact that the Lord was their inheritance was a far, far greater blessing. Here's what it says in the Book of Education. The appointed ministers of the sanctuary, the Levites, received no landed inheritance. They dwelt together in cities set apart for their use and received their support from the tithes and the gifts and offerings devoted to God's service. They were the teachers of the people, guests at all their festivities and everywhere honoured as servants and representatives of God. So that was their position, so to speak. They were the teachers of the people. They were the guests at their festivities, and they were honoured as representatives of God and the servants of God. That was their reward. Wonderful. And that was a far bigger blessing than just having a plot of land. So are there parallels from the Exodus that we can glean for the last generation? And Paul says this, <coughs> excuse me, in the book of Corinthians, he says all these things, he's talking about the Exodus here, all these things were our examples. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now that is a direct quote from Exodus chapter 32, when the golden calf incident took place. So he's quoting from that incident at Mount Sinai with the golden calf, when he says the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And then he adds this a bit later, all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. What does that mean? That means what took place at Mount Sinai with that golden calf incident and the apostasy was written especially for those who are going to live at the end of the world. And of course, that principle we can see spelled out here. The history of the wilderness life of God's chosen people is chronicled for the benefit of the Israel of God to the close of time. That's us. The apostle says, now all these things happen under them for ensamples, and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So the question is, how is this going to play out in the future? If the golden calf incident was a shadow for us in the last days, what, are we, what can we expect to have happen? And again, we've got some wonderful insights from the spirit of prophecy. There's a book called Selected Messages three volumes, and in book number two of those, pages 36 to 38, it talks about this fanaticism that came in to a conference in uh, Indiana in the United States. And Ellen White was told about what took place, and she wrote a letter back to Haskell, I think it was, Stephen Haskell, and this is her letter regarding what she wrote about that. And you can see the quote there. I'll, I'll make it larger here. This is blown up here. So this is Ellen White writing back to Stephen Haskell, talking about what he had described as taking place in Indiana, where in this holy flesh movement, just to explain this holy flesh doctrine that was being taught, was that through loud music, that included drums, the people would have some sort of um, experience, should we say, that literally changed their flesh so they couldn't sin anymore. They'd become sinless, perfectly sinless flesh. That's why they called it holy flesh, and they couldn't sin anymore. And they were doing crazy things, believing that they couldn't do any sin. 
And this is what Ellen White wrote. She said, the things you've described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me would take place just before the close of probation. Now, are we living in that time? I totally believe we are, that we are very close to the close of the probation. <clears throat> so we're going to see this come soon. She says, every unthing, every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. There will be, future tense, shouting with drums, music and dancing. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. She went on to say, the Lord showed me that erroneous theories and methods would be brought into our camp meetings and that the history of the past would be repeated. I felt greatly distressed. She says, those things which have been in the past will be in the future. Satan will make music a snare by the way in which it's conducted. In fact, she went on to say this, better never have the worship of God blended with music than to use musical instruments to do the work which last January was represented to me would be brought into our camp meetings. So clearly, she was saying there's going to come a time in the future from her day, just before the close of probation, where music would come into St. Venice camp meetings, which would do a work which was of Satan, just like the false revival that they had at the Holy Flesh movement in Indiana, which was really foreshadowed by the Golden Calf incident when they made this idol and played loud music and danced around the Golden Calf naked. So it's going to happen again. What is the future role of the 144,000? Can we glean that? Well, it says... In Revelation 7, verse 15, they serve him day and night in his temple. So let's delve into that for a little bit, see if we can learn anything here. Where is the temple in the future? Now, some people point to this verse here, and it says in Revelation 21, I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb of the temple of it. And they say, hey, there is no temple in the future. It says so right here in verse 22 of chapter 21 in Revelation. But when it says no temple therein, the therein means in the new Jerusalem, in the city. And if you connect the Bible together, the 144,000 serve him day and night in his temple, and yet they envision John saw no temple in the city. What does that mean? It means obviously the temple is not in the city, but it's outside and this is exactly what Ella White was shown in vision she says here this is from early writings then we looked up and saw the great city so she's talking about the new Jerusalem here and later she says then we began to look at the glorious things outside of the city and she talks in there where those dots are so they left the city and they walked through some hills and forests then she says, Mount Zion was just before us, and on the mount was a glorious temple. So here we are. This is the temple, not inside the city, but it's outside. So it's obviously been moved out there for a purpose. And here's a little clue as to what it will be used for. It says, as we were about to enter the holy temple, Jesus raised his lovely voice and said, only the 144,000 enter this place. And we shouted, Alleluia. Now, there's an interesting tie-up straight away. So here's uh, the temple, the temple that God is now in, which is serving in the investigative judgment and everything else that's going on. At some stage, it's going to be moved outside of the new Jerusalem <coughs> when it comes down to, to this earth. The earth is created new. And the 144,000 will be serving him in there. And only the 144,000 will be allowed to go into that. And there's a parallel, of course. Remember, only the Levites were actually allowed to go into the temple on earth. Remember in Jerusalem, the people could come to the courtyard where they sacrificed their lambs, but only the priests went inside the temple itself. And here, in the New Jerusalem, only the 144,000 go into this temple. 
So what's the purpose can, of this? Can, can I ask you a question? Yes, by all means, yes. <clears throat> you know, there is said that it was just 144,000 who could walk into that temple. You know, yes. so, so do you believe that uh, 144,000 is uh, 144,000, you know, or do you think it's a, uh, what do you call it in English, uh, it's a sim symbolic? I mean, if it's symbolic, how can so many people get room into a temple? Um, well, we are told now, if you go to Daniel 7, that it says when the thrones are set up at the start of the judgment, it says thousand thousands ministered unto him and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. So there's millions, millions can fit into this temple, obviously. It's huge. It's vast. Okay. Um, much bigger than the one on earth. The one on earth was a scale model, but it was <laughs> scaled down quite a lot. Because obviously the one in temple, the temple in heaven is huge. Um, whether the 144,000 is literal or symbolic, um, I know that's a debate that people have, of course, as you know. <laughs> um, I can share my opinion. My opinion is I don't have any problem with it being literal. In fact, the Bible even says, the Bible says the 144,000 in number. Mm -hmm. You know, he it says John heard the number of them, and he heard one hundred and forty four thousand. And a point you could bring out is this: yes, Revelation is full of symbols, and people say therefore the one hundred and forty four thousand is symbolic. But one thing that's not a symbol in Revelation is the numbers. There are no symbolic numbers in the book of Revelation. Like when it says there were seven last plagues, there were seven of them. When it talks about the seven churches, there, were, there weren't eight or nine or four or five. There were seven churches. Even though the churches were symbolic, there were still seven of them. So I've never seen a symbolic number, if you know what I mean, in Revelation. So... I know people struggle with that, saying only 144,000. You know, if you do the maths, if you look at the world population today, that means that's only about one in 50,000 people would be part of that. And people struggle with that because they say, well, there's 20 million Adventists. And we got, we'll touch on that as we go through. Um, are there going to be a lot of martyrs? And that's one of the questions we'll look at. So... I'll just share my opinion there. <laughs> I think it's a miracle for the Lord to get to 144,000 through. You know, it will be well, <laughs> We have no idea what they are going to go through. I, look, I totally agree. Look at look at the, the foreshadowings. Like, for example, how many, how many people got on the Noah's Ark? And the world population must have been huge. But only eight got on the ark. You had Gideon's army, over 30,000 soldiers, and God says too many, and he whittled it down to just one out of 100 of those, you know. So I personally don't have a problem with it being a literal number. Um, I I wouldn't want to argue with those who struggle with that. But anyway, that's <laughs> just an aside. So mm -hmm. I think we're probably on the same page, I believe. Amen. <laughs> So what is the purpose of the temple in the future? And, of course, we can go back to Daniel 7 and where the court is convened in heaven. And we know the story of Daniel. Four beasts come up out of the sea, the lion and then the, the bear, then the leopard, then the, the terrible, dreadful dragon thing. And out of the head of that dragon comes a little horn speaking great things. And we know who this power represents. And while this little horn has done its thing, it's, um, it reigns for 1260 years, time, times, and half a time. And when it's done that, then something else is brought to view to Daniel. So after the 1260, after the little horn has done its thing for time, times, and half a time, he watched, he says, until thrones were set in place. And the Ancient of Days sat it says thousand thousands ministered unto him, ten thousand times ten thousand. So this is this is this huge temple, it's massive. 
And it says the judgment was set and the books were opened. Amazing. And actually, we find that a couple of times, obviously there in Daniel chapter 7. And also in Revelation 20, we find again the books being opened. And this is during the millennium. So these books are being used in the judgment at the end of the 1260, before Jesus comes back. And we find the books being opened again during the thousand years. Now, the cleansing of the sanctuary represents the final judgment, as we know from study. So what will happen during the millennium? And we find this here. Thrones are being set up. <coughs> Excuse me. They that sat on them, and judgment was given unto them, and they lived with and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And Paul talked about this judgment taking place during the millennium. He says, Do you not know that we, sh the saints, shall judge the world? Know you not that we shall judge angels? So obviously, during the millennium, when the saints are judging the world and judging the angels, they're using the books in heaven. So what are these books in heaven? Well, <clears throat> if we go through the Bible and look for God's books, in Revelation 21, it talks about the Lamb's book of life. So no one will enter into the city that defileth or worketh abomination or makes a lie, but only those who have written in the Lamb's book of life. Interesting. And in Philippians, he talked about his fellow helpers in the gospel. He says, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with my other, other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Interesting. Ellen White explains it this way. <coughs> Sorry about my <coughs> croaky voice. I'll just have a quick drink here. <laughs> <coughs> Ellen White said, if we could only see and understand that the repentance of one soul sends inexpressible joy through all the host of heaven, melody is called forth from every harp and every voice and glorious anthems because another name is registered in the book of life. Another light is kindled to shine amid the moral darkness of this corrupt world. So one soul repenting, one person giving their life to Jesus brings forth all this beautiful music as their name is registered in the book of life. So clearly the book of life is like a register of those who choose to follow Jesus. Now, there's also a book of remembrance. It talks about a Malachi. It says, a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and thought on his name. And there's obviously a book of iniquity because it talks about how iniquity is marked before the Lord. You find that in Jeremiah chapter 2, 22. <clears throat> and great controversy spells it out very plainly. The books of heaven. So there's the book of life, which contains the names of all who have entered the service of God. The book of remembrance. <coughs> Sorry, I do apologize for my freaky throat. A book of remembrance is written before God, in which are recorded the good deeds of them that feared the Lord. And number three is there's a record of sins also. So these are the books of record in heaven. And what explains, in the book of God's remembrance, every deed of righteousness is immortalized. There, every temptation resisted, every evil overcome, every word of tender pity expressed is faithfully chronicled. And every act of sacrifice, every suffering and sorrow endured for Christ's sake is recorded. Interesting, Ellen White uses the word immortalized there. Immortalized, you know what? You know what the word immortal means? It means it will never die, never disappears, live forever. So our deeds, it says, are immortalized in this book of remembrance. How does that work? Well, it's because those record books contain a record of our life, and that will never be erased. It says, remember that your life is recorded in the books of heaven to be opened before the assembled universe. Interesting. 
So what do these books look like? Now, you can see in the artist depiction here, um, the artist has drawn it like a great big bound volume with pages with writing on it. <laughs> and obviously the Bible talks about books because I that was probably the best analogy that they could use 2,000 years ago was books. Now, when Ella White wrote about this, obviously technology had come a little bit further along the way. Even photography had been developed. And the early, earliest form of photography that they were using in Ella White's day was called daguerreotype. And she used that as an analogy. She says this in the book Maranatha, angels are taking a daguerreotype of the character. That word daguerreotype is an early form of photography. She says angels of God are taking like a, you could say a photograph of the character just as accurately as the artist takes the likeness of the human features. And it's from this that we're to be judged. And there's other quotes too where she says similar things. She says, remember, your character is being daguerreotyped by the great master artist in the record books of heaven, as minutely as the face is reproduced upon the polished plate of the artist. What do the books say in your case? <clears throat> Sorry. So they, and when they did the daguerreotype, they used to use a polished metal plate. That's why it talks about the polished plate of the artist. But, you know, does that mean that the books of in heaven are a big photo album? And the answer is no. Ellen White explains here. She says, in the case of each individual, there is a process going forward which is far more wonderful than that which transfers the features to the polished plate of the artist. The art of the photographer merely imprints the likeness on perishable substance. But in the life record, the character is faithfully delineated. And in this record, however dark, can never be effaced except by the blood of the atoning sacrifice. So the best analogy Ellen White could use back in her day was photography. I suppose if we wanted to use an analogy today, we'd say it's like a, um, a video library, like a DVD library. You know what I mean? Where everything's recorded. <laughs> But, you know, it's, even that wouldn't be adequate. It's more wonderful than that because Anna White spells out, even the thoughts and intents of the heart stand faithfully delineated, written in living characters. So what's being recorded in heaven is not just our outward actions, but even what we're thinking and our intention. So it's it's even far more wonderful than TV or video, if you know what I mean. So even our best analogy can't explain how our lives are being recorded. And what's the purpose that God is, <coughs> excuse me, recording all this? We go back to the story of Abraham. Do you remember how he was tested? He had to offer up his son Isaac. And that was a severe test. He was a son of promise. And then God says, now go and sacrifice him. And it says in Hebrews, Abraham accounted that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. So Abraham, by faith, believed, even if I slay him, God can raise him up again. And this was done to show even angels aspects of the plan of salvation. Like the Bible says, which things the angels desire to look into. And the white spells it out here. The sacrifice required of Abraham was not alone for his own good, nor solely for the benefit of succeeding generations, but it was also for the instruction of the sinless intelligences of heaven and of other worlds. The field of controversy between Christ and Satan, the field on which the plan of redemption is wrought out, is the lesson book of the universe. And that's the point. Everything that takes place on this earth is going to be a lesson book, which is going to be studied for eternity. I've got some quotes coming up that show that. That God is going to show the universe aspects of his character through the plan of salvation on earth, 
that is going to keep the universe secure for eternity. And we, in our lives, are making up that lesson book that's going to be studied. It says, day by day, the record of your words, your actions, and your influence is being made in the books of heaven. So, what if there's things in those books that we don't want recorded there? We've all sinned, it says, and fallen short of the glory of God. And it might say, all sin unrepented of and unconfessed will remain upon the books of record. It will not be blotted out. It will not go beforehand to judgment to be cancelled by the atoning blood of Jesus. The accumulated sins of every individual will be written with absolute accuracy as the penetrating light of God's law will try every secret of darkness. In proportion to the light, to the opportunities, and the knowledge of God's claims upon them will be the condemnation of the rejectors of God's mercy. But of course, there's a little wonderful promise in there. Sin can be cancelled by the blood of Jesus. We can ask forgiveness for our sins, and that record in heaven of that, that sin, whatever it may be, if we confess it, we say, Lord, please cleanse me from that sin, his blood will literally blot out that record. I mean, how it does it, how it works, we don't know. When I say literally, I mean, Jesus' blood somehow blots out the record of our sin. So will these books be used after the millennium? Clearly they're being used now in the investigative judgment. They'll be used during the millennium. They'll be used for eternity, we're told. Here from Desire of Ages, it says, Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look. And it will be their study throughout endless ages. So this world that we live on, everything that we do that makes up the history of this world in our personal lives <clears throat> is going to be studied for eternity. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's why it says this in the book of Luke. There is nothing covered <coughs> Excuse me, that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in the closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. So here Jesus was trying to re explain to people, there's nothing you can hide. Everything will be revealed. And when the history of this world is studied, this is speaking about students. When it says the student here, they will be open to the student. This is speaking about people in the new earth for eternity. There will be open to the student history of infinite scope and of wealth inexpressible. Then she says this, here, from the vantage ground of God's word, the student is afforded a view of the vast excuse me, field of history and may gain some knowledge of the principles that govern the course of human events. But his vision is still clouded and his knowledge incomplete. Not until he stands in the light of eternity will he see thing, all things clearly. Then, so this is speaking about through eternity, then will be opened before him the course of the great conflict that had its birth before time began, and that ends only when time shall cease. The history of the inception of sin, of fatal falsehood and its crooked working, of truth that swerving not from its own straight lines has met and conquered, all will be made manifest. The veil that interposes between the visible and the invisible world will be drawn aside and wonderful things will be revealed. So even today, we don't know. We can't see everything because there's angels ministering around us and we can't see what's happening. But in the future, when we can study the history, we can see how angels ministered in our lives. So how do we expunge? sin from those record books that are going to be studied for eternity it says when the times are refreshing shall come from the presence of the lord then the sins of the repentant soul who received the grace of christ and is overcome through the blood of the lamb will be removed from the records of heaven and will be placed upon satan the scapegoat the originator of sin and be remembered no more against him forever the sins of the overcomers will be blotted out 
of the books of record, but their names will be retained on the book of life. So our sins can be blotted out. That's the wonderful news. We could ask, why was Satan permitted to cause so much misery and why? Why was that allowed to happen? And here's that question being answered. For what or why was the great controversy permitted to continue throughout the ages? Why was it that Satan's existence was not cut short at the very outset of his rebellion? And here's the answer. It was that the universe might be convinced of God's justice in his dealing with evil, that sin might receive eternal condemnation. In the plan of redemption, there are heights and depths that eternity itself can never exhaust, marvels into which angels desire to look. The redeemed, only of all created beings, have in their own experience known the actual conflict with sin. They have wrought with Christ, and as even as the angels could not do, have entered into the fellowship of his sufferings. Then she asks this question, will they have no testimony as to the science of redemption, nothing that will be of no worth, I'm sorry, nothing will be of worth to unfallen beings? It's a rhetorical question, of course. The answer is yes, of course, we've got something very valuable to share. It's our, it's our experience. She goes on to say, even now, unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places is made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God. So think about that for a moment. The principalities and powers in the heavenly places, we're talking about unfallen beings like angels, so to them is made known through the church, that's God's people on earth, the manifold wisdom of God. So God is using his people on earth, his church, to show the, his wisdom to the unfallen beings. That's what that passage is saying. And he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Here's some more quotes that spell out the importance of this. Amazing statement, this one. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. That's when Satan deceived all those angels. Human perfection failed in Eden, the paradise of bliss. That's when Adam and Eve sinned. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The death of Christ on the cross of Calvary is our only hope in this world, and it will be our theme in the world to come. So what's taking place on this earth is going to be studied for eternity because it's going to prevent any more rebellion against God. Just as the angels in heaven rebelled against God and a third of them had to be cast out, just as this world starting the Garden of Eden, fell, and Adam and Eve rebelled against God, and we're suffering the results. We're all rebels. We've all sinned. It's going to be the death of Christ on the cross that is going to prevent any more rebellion like that, because people will see clearly that sin, as attractive as it is, ends up ultimately with the death of God, the death of Jesus. That's where it leads to. Trying to find another way to live outside of God's perfect law and God's ways of doing things is death. That's just how it is. That's the principle. And so what's taken place on this earth is the lesson book for the universe for eternity because it shows this is what happens when you try to choose another way of living aside from the way that God shows is best. It ends up with the corruption and horrific things we see in this world today. So trials are a part of our walk. It says we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. But we're told that this is only for a moment, and it's going to work for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. 
<clears throat> now, getting back to a question you had earlier, Eva, um, about the 144,000 being literal, people struggle with it being literal because they say if it's a literal number, that means there's going to be a lot of martyrs in the last days. If, there's, if the church has 20 million people in it today, and yet, and there's going to be a lot of converts coming in, and then you end up with 144,000 only, what's going to happen? Well, we find this. We find it hinted at. You have this harlot woman in Revelation 17. And this harlot woman, it says, is drunken with the blood of the saints. What does that mean? There's a lot of blood going to be shed. And what it says, the persecutions of Protestants by Romanism, by which the religion of Jesus Christ was almost annihilated, will be more than rivaled when Protestantism and Popery are combined. Wow. So we ain't seen anything yet, so to speak. You know, the saying, we ain't seen nothing yet. <clears throat> Here's another interesting statement. The scenes of the betrayal, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ have been reenacted and will again be reenacted on an immense scale. Wow. There's going to be a lot of martyrs. That's this the reality. But you know, here's a wonderful promise. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they're fulfilling as co-workers with him. And of all the gifts that heaven can bestow upon men, Fellowship with Christ in his sufferings is the most weighty trust and the highest honour. And that may take a while to, for us to grasp, but actually sufferings for Jesus' sake is the highest honour and weightiest trust that we can have. Because when our life is studied for eternity, those times when we suffered for Jesus are going to be highlights, if you like. And that record, when the unfallen beings, as they review our life again, they say, look at that. They stood for Jesus against all the odds, even though it involved suffering for them. They were willing to do that for Jesus' sake. <clears throat> so those who go through this period will constitute the 144,000. They have that song of experience. So we have some challenges. <clears throat> Sorry about that. It says, when the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. Do you get that? The majority. To fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test. So. That's what we're going to face. But by God's grace, we'll be fine. Here's a wonderful statement. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself and his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. So can we see some parallels, just to wrap up here, between the Exodus and... And the 144,000, the last generation. And absolutely we can. The tribe of Levi, they stood in a time of apostasy and false worship at the golden calf incident. When all the rest of Israel were bowing down to the golden calf, the Levites were not partaking in that false apostasy. And likewise, the last generation, they will stand when there's going to come apostasy and false worship into Adventism with the Holy Flesh movement being repeated again and also the false revival and the Mark of the Beast test. The Levites, because they were faithful, were appointed to serve God in the temple and likewise the 144,000 served God day and night in his temple. Only the Levites could go into the temple and only the 144,000 go into the heavenly temple. The Levites, Levites ministered to Israel by helping them understand the plan of salvation. They ministered in the sanctuary to show this is God's solution to the sin problem. 
And likewise, it appears that the 144,000 serving them day and night in the temple where the record books are kept will be helping unfallen beings appreciate the plan of salvation. And the tribe of Levi were the honoured guests at the feasts and were the teachers of the people. Likewise, the last generation, the 144,000, will accompany Jesus through the universe, sharing the deep things of God and serving him in his temple. So they will have this honoured role. So, brothers and sisters, let's wrap up by saying, as Ellen White said, we should strive. I haven't got the quote here, but Ellen White said, strive to be among the 144,000. If we were living in ancient Israel, and we were living in the camp of Israel when the apostasy of the golden calf came, we would have gone and stood with the Levites and said, we're going to stand for God. And likewise, when the trials and tests ahead, we should say, we want to be part of that group that's going to be faithful. And what an amazing reward the 144,000 will have in the future. So, any questions? Well, <clears throat> you just came with the last quote, which I was going to say, and as it was says that we should strive to be among the 144,000. So, <clears throat> Um, why do you think, I, I mean, I pray about that uh, every day, mostly every day. Uh, they will have an experience which no one else have had on this earth before. Uh, but still, you know, most people say, oh, you know, I can die now, then I don't need to go through that time. So why do you think, <laughs> uh, you know, she encourages us to pray to be among the 144,000? Well, <clears throat> yes, and those who who die and then are resurrected will, won't go through the plagues and the trials and the mark of the beast test. Um, and fine, but those who, by God's grace, can be part of that, who can withstand, um, will have an experience that is going to be um, valuable hugely valuable for eternity because when this the history of this world is studied through eternity to show god's amazing love god's providence and people's lives to save them um our life story is going to be repeated well reviewed again and again and again you know what i mean and so if by standing for truth and righteousness we can we can what's the word build a life story that's that's compelling and uh should we say exciting or you know honors god then it's like um well what can i say what a wonderful reward you know the 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 honor that we will receive not that we're seeking honor but our life story will shine even brighter I, I suppose it's a bit hard to find the right words. You know, there's a passage in Daniel that says, those that lead turn many to God will shine as the stars forever. Um, and that's speaking about the last generation. Um, I hope I'm making sense. Because, <laughs> you know, the parallel with the Levites, they stood firm at the golden calf incident and God blessed them and rewarded them with serving him. He was their inheritance instead of, a plot of land, and likewise, the hundred and forty-four thousand will serve God day and night as their honor, and their life story will be studied for eternity. You know, how did they become the hundred and forty-four thousand? Um, what did they go through? So, I mean, what more? <laughs> what more can I say? I'm hope. I hope you know what I'm driving at. You might have an answer to that question yourself. Well, it probably is that, you know, they want, uh, of course, to live up to the light God has given them all the time. But, uh, you know, it doesn't matter to them if God put them to rest now. So they don't need to go through the time of trouble. Yes. Here's the point. Exactly. God knows what each of us can handle. He knows what we're capable of. And if we have to rest in the grave, fine. So be it. Um, 
at the end of the day, everyone will be happy with their reward. You know, <laughs> there won't be any jealousy in heaven. Someone saying he's got a big, better reward than me. So it's just it comes back to total trust in God. Say, Lord, you know what I can handle. If I can't, couldn't handle the, the seven last plagues and the mark of the beast test, and I'm going to rest in the grave, I humbly accept that. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's um, it's total trust in Him. So don't you think that all of us? Do you think, oh, we cannot manage to go through that? But that's why we need to pray that Lord, uh, you know, prepare us and help us to. I want to go through a time of trouble and be among the 144,000 because God can do in us what we don't feel that we can, you know, can do. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, my question, uh, just maybe in case it's not coming up in my search, I have one of the original research ones from back in the 90s that had, before they put this new search engine in, and uh, strive to be among the 144,000. I don't find in her writings. I find strive to be among, and I put that up twice. They do have it listed in the uh, volume seven in the SDA Bible commentary from 1957, but there is no reference to any of her published works for that actual statement. Both times she stated it in her actual writings, it doesn't include the word 144,000, but it implies it. But I found it interesting, the context with it is, expansive it's not a limited number it's the redeemed of the earth and so it, it, this has been a long time study for me ross i've uh my mindset for the longest time has been to take it as a uh, literal number for many of the reasons you listed such as the numbers in revelation are listed uh are literal numbers but at the same time i had found a quote years ago and i can't seem to find it on the digital work um and this is a lot of years ago, but I remember it. And, and she indicated that the 144,000 were of the great multitude. And that left me consternated, be it was only one quote. But at the time, I remember looking at it and going, well, of is a totally different statement than separate from. Okay. Um, let me share my screen because I've just popped it up on the, did the, in the search engine here. Um, can you see that? Is it? sharing okay mm -hmm. yep so i just put strive to be among here's one from signs of the times it says shall we not rather strive to be among that number of whom john writes here are they that keep the commandments of god and the faith of jesus can you show your hit list down at the bottom uh yes okay here we are okay so that's interesting there's only three come up mine comes up with three but not the same you can see what i put in the chat um i'm okay. not usually i'm not a usually conspiratorially minded individual i like facts but i have <laughs> yes. the search engine i have is the old folio views from the 90s uh before the conference themselves became involved in the white estate and adding in um and i don't know if you know all the story back backstory behind that but they started adding in the pioneers and everything plus they released another fifty thousand pages of stuff they had kept due to the one of the projects that was done by individuals. But one thing I did find is if I use this search engine that I have, which are not, is not owned by the White Estate, Folio Views is an in industry package that searches Boolean style, kind of like yours. Yes. It's the same thing you're doing. Um, yes. So what, I, what I found is the one they use online versus this, I can put many known quotes in, especially about the truth of the Father and the Son. They do not come up in the search engine all the time. But if you know where to find them, they're there. They're in the books that are published and on the white estate. But doing a Boolean parenthetical search, they do not come up. And this is something a few of us have noticed. And it's only with particular statements. Well, you can block Boolean searches with a chain as well. So to me, I like the one you're using, but I find it peculiar. I used exactly the phrase you used, put it in parentheses. And as you can see, it doesn't match the ones that I got. Interesting. I okay. like that one you just put up because it, it does have that context, as John said, and that gives it context. Whereas the other ones I put up, you'll notice it doesn't refer to John or to, you know, but the one for the Re one, one in the seven commentaries says in reference to Revelation 7, 9 to 17. But I know specifically what she said that we weren't to accept it if it wasn't amongst her published writings. And that was not in her public writing, published writings. And there is no reference elsewhere when you search it. It only comes up in the Bible commentary. So it's an addition after her death. It's not part of what she wrote. Mm. 
See, I don't know if you're aware, Ross, but uh, for instance, uh, a, a 2SP volume, I have a, the whole, whole of it here, and it starts with a foreword that states none of these are the writings of Ellen White. They are that of a stenographer and are there to give us a better understanding of her person, and yet they're recorded with the White Estate records of her writings. But if you read the foreword, that whole volume was written by Stenos. She said we're not to accept those as her works. So we have to be careful what we're reading. And, and that's what's given me some consternation here is the fact you're getting this one, which I think is a very good reference. It will not come up in my search with that same ref exact reference. And I put it even in parentheses to make sure it was restricted. Really? So you've put in strive to be among that number as a phrase? I just, I even made it more limited. I went strive to be among so that it didn't limit to number or 144,000. It still only comes up three times once in the SDA and the two that I posted in the chat. Wow. Seems we can't trust anything these days. <laughs> well, she said there would be an effort to undermine her works. There's overt action, right? And there's covert action. And yeah. typically, um, it, what is not stead, said can often be more important than what is. I know I write business contracts, do legal and, and accounting work as a living. And I'm often more interested in what a contract omits than what it states, because yeah, yeah. Yep. if it's not stated, my question always is, how come? Why did you leave this out when it's a convention? It would normally be in here. Why did you leave it out? You don't wish to be bound by it, right? And that's what my job is, is I research and fully study the documents that are presented in contracts. And I'm always looking for what's omitted, not overtly stated. Mm -hmm. And this being, we know openly from the estate that from 1935, basically onward, and especially with the death of the last pioneer, the true pioneer, one of the early days, um, when they started really altering the works and stuff in 1944, um, Leroy Froome himself said, we were ob obliged, you know, you can read that in, in his volume, we were obliged to alter the works as they no longer reflected what the general body believes. Mm. Have you read that? No, I haven't read that. I'll give you the reference here to it, because that's what got me kicked out of the church. <laughs> it wasn't that I intended to. I was senior Sabbath school teacher, and I worked in mission for many years. But uh, I was teaching Sabbath school and resigned. And then I was con I confronted Leroy Froome's statements in 2016 before the church, because they asked me to teach. I refused to teach the lesson. And then they started to read from it, and we got as far as Thursday's lesson. And I said, well, folks, here's a question for you. Can you reconcile this? 422? Uh, that's what I'm thinking. Let me look and see. 122. It's from the uh, book Movement of Destiny by Leroy Froome. Okay. Okay. Yep. I'm, and, I've, I've heard of them. I haven't got them, but yep. As a, wasn't that a series of four? Uh, this one stands free. There is a series of four. I have most of his writings, not all, but most. I studied him quite thoroughly in years past, and then we bought the home we're in, and it had been owned. The second owner before us um, had been a friend of ours, a Seventh-day Adventist, and he had left them all here. Perchance the next owner, which was a Seventh-day Adventist, would, would desire them, and they didn't. But he tried to sell the home us originally, so we ended up with him in the long run after all, and uh, I've kept them as reference material, but for some reason my bookmark has gone out of this spot. But he um, he made no bones about it. He uh, clearly stated that he could not find anything about the workings of the Holy Spirit specifically noted in uh, published writings, Adventist published writings. So he had to go to external sources. And then he said, of course, having concluded what we concluded, we had to, uh, he said it in this way, he said we had to alter many of the standard works. Um, Uriah Smith's Daniel Revelation, which is my favorite study. I spent a lot of time on it. And uh, th they took over a chapter out of there. Um, at all because they, were, a, they couldn't leave it there. I had a friend who went through the 1897 Daniel Revelation and the 1947 edition or 45, whenever it was, the second 45. one. Line by line, word by word, to spot all the differences. And I thought it was actually, I don't know what the right word, dishonest or criminal to call it Daniel Revelation by Uriah Smith when it was so heavily edited. That wasn't the book that he wrote, but of course it was published as such. 
I was greatly offended when I discovered it because I come from another faith and uh, I, uh, I'm i just going to give this to my book wife. She knows where it's better. I used to have it memorized. I know part of it's on 231, but I couldn't. I went looking for it in a meeting here a while ago and I thought I put a marker in it. No, it got me in extreme trouble with the conference and everything because I simply stated, well, I'm simply asking a question. Uh, you say you accept the prophet and she says the power, the Holy Spirit is the power and presence of God. And uh, that was in Science at the Times so in November. And I had read that and knew it fairly well by heart. And then they stated on Thursday's lesson, 2016, the second week of January, that the Holy Spirit is not the power and presence of God. And it was signed off by Leroy Froome. And I'd gone through that in my personal studies. And so I asked the question, so do you accept the prophet's words or Leroy Froome? And I simply asked that question. And then they gave a Bible verse to support it. And so I gave a Bible verse that contradicted their interpretation of the Bible first. I said, so you need you need to reconcile these. And they had been my class for 12 years prior to that. But uh, the leadership was offended at that and uh, told me I wasn't free to speak anymore. So. I am not sure. Yes. Well, sadly. Yeah, yeah. here we are. This is the one Should... specifically against Uriah <laughs> Smith. It's found on page 465 under changing the impaired image of Adventism. So even the title is revealing. It says the removal of the last standing vestige of Arianism in our standard literature was accomplished through the deletion from the classic Daniel and Revelation in 1944. It pretty clearly admitted and stated, and that's in a standard work of Seventh-day Adventists, highly touted and highly referenced. Mm. The other one I was looking for, here we are, uh, page 422. I was looking on 432. Revision of Daniel and the Revelation became inevitable. So that's a whole chapter before this. Uh, it says the corrections of certain books necessary, the next logical and inevitable step in the implementing of our unified fundamental beliefs involved the revision of certain standard works so as to eliminate statements that taught and thus perpetuated erroneous views on the Godhead. Such sentiments were now sharply at variance with the accepted fundamental beliefs set forth in the church manual. So the church manual now is more important than the prophet's words. Because she herself said of Daniel Revelation that he had the right view on the matter. So, yeah, it makes it difficult. I, I'm i careful that I do my research not from compilations because that's where most of the problems seem to be. And I think a lot of them are innocent. I don't, I don't wish to always imply that there's been an intent. But writings like, like that make it clear there was intent. Uh, and so I stick to the things that were published in her lifetime because that's what she says in her words, her own words. She says, if it doesn't come from her published writings, we're not to accept it. She said, let them change not one word, lest they turn on or off the intent of the meaning as the Lord gave it to me. Yes. I agree. The intent probably with most people, but of course it only takes even people innocently can or doing what they think is right can you and improve, I could improve what the prophet right you know they're, they're touching things that they shouldn't even touch she actually used that word she says many of my many have said we want to insert this word that it would improve the meaning she says touch not one word yeah <clears throat> yeah i appreciate and, that i um, and, that, and yet that, they bring out gender neutral versions <laughs> oh. you know, when the women's ordination issue was coming up, people were quoting E.G. White, but someone pointed out, hey, that's that's a gender neutral version of a book. Oh. And well, if, no, if you look at what Ellen White wrote, it wasn't what was being quoted. When we joined the church, it, it caught, had had me very close to reconsidering, and we went through great deliberations before we joined Adventism. And one of the first articles I read, because they they give us a free year subscription to re, the Review and Herald, which they at, at that I don't know if they do now, but at that time the BC Conference did that with every member. And one of the first articles I read uh, was by McClure, who at the time was North American Division Conference president, and he was doing an article on that. And he his summation words of the article on women's ordination, and I was being ordained within a few weeks of that, and he stated having ordained i think it was 33 women at the time in the north american division he said having ordained 33 women we've gone far too far to turn back and that was just like somebody had punched me right in the forehead i thought if i join an organization that doesn't believe in repentance and this is the top speaker in the nation 
and he says we've come too far and not long after that at my ordinate the week of my ordination a woman had been visiting the area from edmonton and her husband came up to me and introduced her and he said we've decided to stay over for your ordination i thought okay well, that's interesting i don't know you but uh and and then he immediately gave their reasons my wife is being ordained the following weekend in edmonton and we wanted to watch the service and oh. that blew my mind i was i was a pentecostal from a very uh firm form of pentecostalism i'd never heard such an idea of a woman being ordained to the ministry and so i was silent i didn't know what to say but then since that of course it's it's spread throughout but what stunned me the most is with just the simple words it wouldn't have mattered what it was in reference to that we've come too far to turn back um this 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 is until we come out of that that's a very typical laodicean tradition but thank yes. you for bringing that out because i thought that this particular one because you have folio views that's the search engine you're using and yeah, uh yeah. Yep, it was most accurate. I found it to work well, but it brought up four. Four. You have two different quotes than the two I have here. So. Uh, that's that's that's. Anyway, we have to look into that. Hey, we better close. We've been over an hour, I suppose. And <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you so much, Vern, for all your uh, thoughts and what you were sharing with us. And uh, of course, thank you, Ross, for. Uh, sharing with us uh, what the, uh, God's plan for the 144,000. And uh, so, Tanya, maybe you would like to close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for that we could come together uh, and, uh, for, uh, in, in Zoom. And thank you for what uh, Ross shared about uh, being among the 144,000, pray that you may help us all to to be uh, molded in your will and and to have uh, to to and, uh, and it's uh, only by your grace we uh, will be able to stand and uh, and uh, do it, and we need your to be filled with your spirit mm -hmm. and also a uh, contrite heart to uh, to learn to learn and have a, a complete confidence in you thank you so much chef and uh, and i pray for uh, may you all uh, may you bless us uh, be with us in the coming days and to stay true to you and and stand on you when it when it, it will cost pray that in your son jesus name amen 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 Thank you.